Good evening, and thank you for joining us for this webinar hosted by PSNC on dispensing control drugs. Today's speakers include myself, Suraj Shah, PSNC's Drug Tariff and Reimbursement Manager. We also have Leila Rehman, PSNC's Regulation Officer, and Mitish Budia, PSNC's Dispensing and Supply Supervisor. As PSNC's focus relates mainly to the delivery of NHS-funded services by community pharmacies, including the dispensing of NHS scripts, the content of this webinar will be focused mainly on the dispensing of CD prescriptions. Although not exhaustive, we will also explore several regulatory aspects of CDs, particularly those that impact directly on dispensing. So during this webinar, we will be covering key differences between Schedules 1 to 5, prescription requirements for Schedule 2 and 3 CDs, emergency supplies of CDs, different types of prescriptions, including those issued by EPS, brand prescribing of certain CDs, instalment dispensing and package dose fees, the correct endorsing and submission of FP10 MDA instalment dispensing forms, payments for CD prescriptions. We'll also be looking at some of the common endorsing errors and finally explore the dispensing of private CD prescriptions and handling of CD requisitions. At the end, we will have some time for question and answers, so please do submit any questions you have throughout the webinar. This webinar is expected to last approximately one hour. If some of your colleagues were not able to join today, or if you missed anything and would like to recap some of the points covered, don't worry as a recording of this webinar will be made available on demand from PSNC's website. I will now hand over to Leila, who will talk you through certain aspects of regulations applicable to CD prescriptions. Good evening all. To help keep things short and simple, we will be referring to control drugs as CDs throughout the webinar. Strict legal controls are needed for certain drugs because they may cause serious problems like dependence and harm if they are not used properly, hence the term CDs. Because some of these drugs have the potential to be used illegally, for example, in drug misuse, Extra safety measures are needed to make sure they are stored, prescribed, supplied and used safely and legally. In the Misuse of Drugs 2001 regulations, drugs are divided into five schedules, each specifying the requirements governing such activities as import, export, production, supply, possession, prescribing and record keeping which apply to them. As you can see, there are some examples of drugs in each schedule shown. Just to point out, Schedule 4 is split into two parts. This table summarises the key differences in the requirements for different CD schedules. Prescriptions for Schedule 2 and 3 CDs are subject to the special prescription requirements. I will talk about these prescription requirements in more detail later. On the length of CD prescription validity, prescriptions for CDs in Schedule 2, 3 and 4 are only valid for 28 days from the appropriate date. In the case of Owings, any remaining balance of Schedule 2, 3 or 4 CDs must also be dispensed within 28 days of the appropriate date on the prescription. It is good practice for the pharmacist or dispenser to make the patient or their representative aware from the outset that they will not be able to receive a supply of any prescribed Schedule 2, 3 or 4 CDs beyond the 28-day period of prescription validity. On prescribing quantities, the Department of Health and Social Care have issued a strong recommendation that the maximum quantity of Schedule 2, 3 or 4 CDs prescribed should not exceed 30 days. Exceptionally, to cover a justifiable clinical need and after consideration of any risk, a prescription can be issued for a longer period, but the reasons for the decision should be recorded in the patient's notes. For Schedule 2 and 3 CD prescriptions, the prescriber's address must be in the UK. You must not dispense a prescription for a CD listed in Schedules 1, 2 or 3 against an EEA or Swiss prescription. This is not the case for Schedule 4 and 5 CDs. Schedule 2 and 3 CDs cannot be prescribed on repeatable prescriptions. Only Schedule 4 and 5 CDs are permitted on repeatable prescriptions. 
Repeat dispensing prescriptions for Schedule 4 CDs must be dispensed for the first time within 28 days of the appropriate date. On record keeping requirements, records of Schedule 2 CDs are required to be kept in a CD register. Home Office strongly recommends the use of a CD register for making records relating to Sativex. For Schedule 3 CDs, records and registers do not need to be kept, although there are requirements for the retention of invoices for two years. For Schedule 4 CDs, there is no requirement to keep records and registers except in the case of Sativex spray. Schedule 5 CDs are exempt for any record keeping requirements, but retention of invoices for two years is required. I will cover emergency supplies for CDs in detail later on. All Schedule 2 CDs except quinobarbitone, secobar, tical, and some Schedule 3 CDs, for example, tamazepam, buprenorphine, are subject to safe custody requirements. Schedule 4 and 5 CDs are not subject to safe custody requirements. In some circumstances, the denaturing of CDs needs to be witnessed by an authorised person. Where there is a requirement to make a CD register entry, legislation also requires destruction witnessed. So expired, obsolete, unwanted stock, an authorised witness is required if drug is in Schedule 2. For patient return CDs, no authorised witness is required. For Schedule 3 CDs, it would be good practice to have another member of staff witness the denaturing. Different types of prescribers hold different prescribing rights. It is important for pharmacy contractors to be able to identify which CD products each type of prescriber is entitled to prescribe. A range of non-medical healthcare professionals can prescribe medicines for patients as either independent or supplementary prescribers. Independent prescribers are practitioners responsible and accountable for the assessment of patients with previously undiagnosed or diagnosed conditions and for decisions about the clinical management required including prescribing. They are recommended to prescribe generically, except where this would not be clinically appropriate or where there is no approved non-proprietary name. Supplementary prescribing is a partnership between an independent prescriber, a doctor or a dentist, and a supplementary prescriber to implement an agreed clinical management plan for an individual patient with the patient's agreement. Independent and supplementary prescribers are identified by an annotation next to their name in the relevant professional register. The table shows different types of prescribers and whether they are allowed to prescribe CD Schedule 2 to 5 on a prescription. For example, doctors can prescribe CD Schedule 2 to 5 on a prescription. A home office license is required to prescribe cocaine, dipipenone, or diamorphine for treating addiction. The prescribers that have a caution sign next to them are restricted or limited in the CDs they can prescribe. For example, pharmacist independent prescribers, they are permitted to prescribe any scheduled 2 to 5 CDs except diamorphine, dipipenone, or cocaine for the treatment of addiction. The prescribers that have a red cross next to them are not allowed to prescribe any schedule 2 to 5 CDs on a prescription. A pharmacist is not allowed to dispense a prescription for a schedule 2 or 3 CD unless all the information required by law is included on the prescription. Prescriptions for schedule 2 and 3 CDs are subject to the following CD prescription requirements. Prescriptions for Schedule 2 and 3 CDs must contain the following. Full name, address and where appropriate age of patient. Drug name, formulation, strength where appropriate, dose, as directed or when required and not permitted. Total quantity, dosage units of the preparation in both words and figures. For liquids, total volume in mils. Prescriber signature and address, date of issue. Prescription must be handwritten in indelible ink and may be computer generated, except for the prescriber's signature which must be handwritten unless the prescription is issued via EPS. For patient address, the use of PO box is not acceptable. However, use of no fixed abode as an address is acceptable, for example in the case of a homeless patient. The dosage form, for example tablets, capsules, 
must be included in a CD prescription, irrespective of whether it is implicit in the propriety name or whether only one form is available. Where appropriate, the strength of the drug must be included. When more than one strength of a preparation exists, the strength required must be specified. The dose, which must be clearly defined, i.e. the instruction 1 as directed, constitute a, as a dose, but as directed on its own does not. Total quantity of preparation must be expressed in both words and figures. For liquids, the total volume in millilitres in both words and figures of the preparation to be supplied. For dosage units such as tablets, capsules, ampules, the total number in both words and figures of dosage units to be supplied must be specified. For example, 28 in words and figures. The prescription must be signed by the prescriber with their usual handwritten signature. Advanced electronic signatures can be accepted for Schedule 2 and 3 CDs where EPS is issued. The prescription must specify the prescriber's address, which must be in the UK. The prescription must include the date on which it was signed or issued. A computer-generated date or rubber stamp is acceptable. The words, for dental treatment only, must be present if the prescription is issued by a dentist. For instalment prescriptions, the prescription must specify the instalment amount and instalment interval. Drugs that are not CDs should not be prescribed on the same form as a Schedule 2 or 3 CD. If a prescription does not fully comply with the CD prescription requirements, pharmacists are able to make minor amendments to prescriptions for Schedule 2 and 3 CDs with minor spelling mistakes, minor typographical errors. This may include, for example, a number being substituted for a letter or two letters being inverted, but where the prescribed's intention is still clear, or where the prescription specifies the total quantity of a preparation only in words or in figures, but not both. In doing this, a pharmacist must exercise due diligence and be satisfied that the prescription is genuine and the CD is being supplied in accordance with the prescriber's intentions. The prescription must be amended in ink or otherwise indelibly and the pharmacist must mark the prescription so that the amendment is attributable to him or her. For example, name, date, signature and GPH registration number. If there is more than one amendment on the same prescription, each amendment must be countersigned. Where an amendment is made by one pharmacist and another pharmacist makes a supply, the Home Office has advised that the second pharmacist should also mark the amendment to indicate that he is also satisfied and it is attributable to him as well. Note, the only above applies to paper prescriptions for CDs as there is no facility for pharmacists to make such minor amendments to electronic prescription for CDs. If a Schedule 2 or 3 CD prescription issued by EPS does not comply with CD prescription requirements, the prescription must be referred back to the prescriber to be correctly written. Pharmacists cannot correct any other errors or omissions, for example missing date, incorrect dose, form or strength. These should be corrected by the original prescriber or, in an emergency, another prescriber authorised to prescribe CDs. Amendments cannot be made by covering letter from the prescriber. The appropriate date is either the signature date or any other date indicated on the prescription by the prescriber, as a date before which the drug should not be dispensed, whichever is later. Prescriptions for CDs in Schedule 2, 3 or 4 is valid for 28 days from the appropriate date, so the 28-day validity period applies from the later of either the signature date, including prescriptions that are forward dated, or the start date, if specified in the body of the prescription. The 28-day restriction includes any owing balances. Prescriptions for CDs in Schedule 5 are valid for 6 months from the appropriate date. For FP10 MDA prescriptions, the first instalment must be dispensed within 28 days of the appropriate date and the remainder should be dispensed in accordance with the directions on the prescription.
Using this mocked up example of a CD prescription for buprenorphine tablet, you can see the prescriber has signed the prescription form on the 21st of June 2021, but has also indicated a start date in the main body of the prescription for the pharmacy to dispense the drug on the 30th of June. In this case, the 30th of June becomes the appropriate date and the 28 day prescription validity period starts from this date. The patient walked into the pharmacy today, 27th of July, this prescription can still be dispensed as it falls just within 28 days of the appropriate date. Assuming there was no start date on the prescription, the 28 days period of validity would begin from the 21st of June. If a patient walked into a pharmacy today, 27th of July, to have this prescription dispensed, it would no longer be valid for dispensing as it would have gone past the 28-day period of validity from the 21st of June. The Human Medicines Regulations 2012 set out the maximum quantity of a pump that can be supplied as an emergency supply. For CDs in Schedule 1, 2 or 3, emergency supplies at the request of a prescriber are not permitted except for phenobarbital if used for the treatment of epilepsy. Emergency supplies of Schedule 1, 2 and 3 CDs at the request of a patient are also not permitted with the exception of phenobarbital Schedule 3 for treatment of epilepsy, where the maximum quantity that can be supplied is up to 5 days treatment only. Phenobarbital can be supplied to patients of UK registered prescribers for the purpose of treating epilepsy. However, emergency supplies of Schedule 1, 2 and 3 CDs, including phenobarbital, cannot be supplied to an EEA Swiss patient or at the request of an EEA Swiss prescriber. Schedule 1, 2 or 3 CDs cannot be supplied in an emergency, whether requested by a UK EEA or Swiss health professionals. Phenobarbital, also known as phenobarbitone or phenobarbitone sodium, is the exception and can be authorised by a UK doctor, dentist, nurse or pharmacist independent prescriber or supplementary prescriber in an emergency for the treatment of epilepsy. For permitted emergency supplies to do at the request of a patient, for example phenobarbital or schedule 4 or 5 CDs, the maximum quantity that, that can be supplied is for 5 days treatment. It is important to note that 5 days is a maximum amount that should be given. The quantity supplied should be no more than is required to carry the patient over to when they can be reasonably expected to get another prescription dispensed. With this in mind, the average we can supply might reasonably be for no more than will cover the patient until Monday tea time. PSNC has received reports from one NHS ENI team who are seeing more than five days worth of CDs supplied, for example, 224 times cocodamol 30 over 500 milligram tablets, 28 times zopiclone 7.5 milligram tablets, and 100 times dihydrocodine tablets, or 100 times codeine tablets. This goes against the legislation that limits the supply up to a maximum of five days treatment. Occasionally, pharmacists may receive NHS 111 urgent medicine supply referrals for patients requesting CDs. The legal requirements regarding the emergency supply of CDs also apply to the CPCS, i.e. where appropriate. Phenobarbitone and phenobarbital sodium Schedule 3 exceptions, Schedule 4 and 5 control drugs may be provided as an emergency supply, but supply is limited up to a maximum of 5 days treatment. Why does NHS 111 sometimes refer patients to a pharmacy for supply of CDs that are not permitted under human medicine regulations? The majority of NHS 111 call advisors are not cl clinicians, so do not assess the legality or clinical appropriateness of the emergency supply request. They are also not trained on the human medicine regulations to determine what constitutes a valid emergency supply. An NHS 111 call handler will advise patients when sending a referral that the pharmacy may decide to make a supply. However, this will be at the professional discretion of the pharmacist. If it is not possible to make an emergency supply due to the prohibitions within the human medicine regulations or other factors, but the pharmacist believes that there is a genuine patient need to obtain a supply of their medicine, the pharmacist must contact NHS 111 to ensure 
that the patient is contacted by another appropriate healthcare professional. Contacting NHS 111 service must not be delegated to the patient. When dealing with a CD request on CPCS, pharmacists are reminded to use the NHS 111 professional line to talk with NHS 111 colleagues if a supply cannot be made in the pharmacy to ensure the patient can be referred to the out-of-hours prescribing team if the pharmacist has assessed that the CD supply is urgently needed. This ensures that the patient is appropriately supported. This action can then be recorded on the CPCS IT system. Pharmacists should provide the patient with advice on the need to ensure repeat prescription orders are made with the appropriate time and therefore the pharmacy will still be able to claim payment for the CPCS consultation outcome due to the referral. I'll now hand over to Dan, who leads on the EPS IT work to talk through prescribing and dispensing of CDs using EPS. Now for some information about electronic prescriptions and processes related to CDs. Schedule 2 and 3 CDs can of course be prescribed using EPS. Medicines that are not Schedule 2 or 3D shouldn't be put on the same prescriptions as other CDs as per British National Formulary Guidance. It remains best practice to record who collected a CD. Some contractors do this on their PMR system to reduce paper and ink usage and some contractors still use the EPS dispense token reverse. If you use the token, you can send those tokens onwards to NHS BSA. Prescribers should not issue EPS prescriptions for liquid oral methadone. Uh, Installment prescribing is still not available on EPS yet. In terms of timeframes, some CDs have a 28 day validity period. You should aim to send EPS messages within the same time frame. Ideally, you'd be sending UPS messages frequently and across the day. Most, but not all, PMR systems enable messages to be sent after day 28. And that's for cases such as in case there is an outage near day 28. EPS dispensed and claimed messages can't be claimed after the 180 day UPS limit. More and more contractors are opting to use an electronic CD register instead of a paper one. Uh, you can see a list of options at our supplier list web page and find out more about EPS CDs at our website as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. We will now look at other types of CD prescription forms. In England, CDs can also be prescribed on the green FP10 forms for single supplies. There is no provision within the NHS regulations to dispense CDs in instalments on a standard FP10 prescription form. To prescribe in instalments, the appropriate blue instalment dispensing form, FP10 MDA, should be used for this purpose. Different instalment dispensing forms are available in other home countries. For private prescribing of Schedule 2 and 3 CDs, standardised prescription forms must be used. And Leila will go through these in more detail later. Although generic prescribing is encouraged, there are some circumstances in which it may be preferable to prescribe drugs by brand name. Brand name prescribing of CDs may be necessary where clinically appropriate and is particularly important for certain modified release preparations which have different release characteristics and where patient familiarity with one brand is important in ensuring patient safety. Due to the differences in pharmacokinetic profiles of modified release products, to minimize the risk of mistakes, it is best to keep individual patients on the same modified release brand. The Specialist Pharmacy Service website has published a document titled Which Medicines Should Be Prescribed? by brand in primary care. The SPS recommends brand name prescribing of the following CDs, buprenorphine and fentanyl patches, oral modified release preparations of morphine, oxycodone and tramadol. However, there are some primary care rebate schemes that drive local brand prescribing of CDs that are not required to be prescribed by brand name. Primary care rebate schemes are contractual arrangements offered by pharmaceutical companies or third party companies which offer retrospective financial rebates to the CCG on GP prescribing expenditure for particular branded medicines. Such schemes may attract a rebate for both the CCG and the primary care member practices, whereas others attract a rebate only for the CCG. The confidential rebate price effectively reduces the price charged to the CCG for that product. So PSNC does not consider such schemes to be appropriate. An example of CDs that are affected by such schemes include methadone, which is available as the brand Fizeptone. 
In many areas, prescriptions for generic methadone are being switched to the brand Fizepto. Unless there are clinical reasons for doing so, routine brand switches should be avoided as they can negatively impact patient care, increase GP work workload, as they will need to rewrite scripts for the brand. Such schemes can drive sudden increases in demand of the brand and potentially lead to shortages or temporary supply issues affecting brand availability locally. If the brand is temporarily, temporarily unavailable, any branded prescriptions will need to be rewritten for the generic to ensure patients can continue to receive their treatments in a timely manner. The schemes also increase community pharmacy workload and can impact on pharmacy stockholding levels. Finally, such schemes distort the fair distribution or availability of margin to pharmacy contractors, which is important to the overall community pharmacy funding. Any local savings that are made to prescribing budgets, which result in lost margin for pharmacy contractors, do not do not save mo money for the NHS overall, as a lost pharmacy margin needs to be made up elsewhere. It is the same argument as one against CCG-led switches to branded generics. If the lost margin is greater than the local the, than the saving in local drug spend, then it is a net loss to the NHS. In England, only the following drugs can be supplied as instalments on the blue FP10 MDA prescription form. All Schedule II CDs, such as methadone, buprenorphine, including the buprenorphine naloxone combination, which are both Schedule III drugs, and diazepam, which is a Schedule IV CD. In addition, single supplies of water for injections can also be prescribed where appropriate, for example, when diamorphine dry powder injections are prescribed to be dispensed in installments. FP10 MDA installment prescription forms cannot be used for any other Schedule 3, 4 or 5 CD or prescription-only medicine. In addition to the daily dose, when prescribing in installments, the prescription must specify the total amount of each installment to be supplied and the intervals between installments. Prescribers are only allowed to order a maximum quantity that will provide treatment for a period not exceeding two weeks, that is a maximum of 14 days treatment. The installment direction is a legal requirement and a pharmacist must only supply the installment on the date on which it is due. However, because there are acknowledged practical difficulties with missed doses and dates when the pharmacy is closed when an installment is due, for example on bank holidays, the Home Office has approved specific wording that gives pharmacists a degree of flexibility when making a supply. In November 2015, the Home Office introduced five types of approved wording for installment prescribing. The first one states, please dispense installments due on pharmacy close days on a prior suitable day. A prescription must specify this wording to enable advanced supplies for any pharmacy closure days. If the prescriber selects installment intervals that takes account of bank holidays or other pharmacy closure dates, it may not be necessary to include this wording. If a person is required to collect more than one day supply at a time and misses the specified day for collection, they will still be able to collect their remaining balance off the installment if the second approved wording listed on your screen is in place. That is, and if, it, if an installment's collection day has been missed, please still dispense the amount due for any remaining days off that installment. The third wording states, consult the prescriber if three or more consecutive day, days of a prescription have been missed. If a patient has not taken the regular prescribed dose of opioid, there is a strong possibility that their tolerance to that drug could have reduced increasing risk of overdose if the usual dose of that medication is then taken. The risks of tolerance and consequent overdose are less with buprenorphine than with methadone. Generally, it is good practice for the pharmacist and the prescriber to communicate about a patient failing to collect their methadone or buprenorphine doses as it may be an indicator of instability or increasing risk. However, if this wording is in place, the prescriber must be consulted if three or four days, three, three days or more are missed. The next approved wording is supervised consumption on daily on collection days, and, and we will um, go through supervised consumption in more detail later. Finally, dispense daily doses in separate containers. Pharmacists may still choose to supply in daily doses or in daily dose containers if this approved wording is not specified on a prescription. For methadone oral solution, if it is supplied in daily dose containers, package dose fees may be claimed for daily dose containers that are supplied. 
The, the approved wording above can also be mixed and matched to express the prescriber's intention. However, as usual, where this intention is not clear, it may be necessary, subject to professional judgment of the pharmacist, to contact the prescriber for clarification. If a pharmacist if a pharmacist decides to supply against a prescription that uses wording that is not approved by the Home Office, it will not provide the same protection from enforcement when making the supply. In this instance, if practical, the pharmacist should try to get the prescription amended by the prescriber to include the correct approved Home Office wording. To support patients undergoing opiate substitution therapy, community pharmacies provide supervised consumption of methadone or buprenorphine as part of a locally commissioned service through either the local authority or via a subcontracted provider of shared care services. Supervised consumption is not a legal requirement under the Misuse of Drugs Regulations 2001. Where supervision is directional or prescription, the pharmacist must consider following this direction. If this instruction is not followed, obviously the pharmacist should consider the risk of supplying the drug unsupervised. Where the instruction to supervise is not followed, it is acceptable to confirm verbally with the prescriber that they are happy with this arrangement. The Department of Health recommends that any deviation away from the prescriber's intended method of supply should be documented and the justification for this recorded. It is also good practice for pharmacists to alert the prescriber whenever there are significant concerns such as when consecutive daily doses of treatment have been missed, repeated missed pickups, or where there are concerns around the patient's health or well-being, or concerns about the patient's presentation, such as intoxication or signs of significant deterioration. So how should instalment dispensing FP10 MDA forms be endorsed correctly? The pharmacist must accurately record the details of each dispensing event on the right-hand side which is the perforated side of the MDA form, ensuring that quantities endorsed reflect the actual quantities that were dispensed to the patient. This is to comply with regulations and to ensure that the NHS BSA, which is the NHS Business Services Authority, can actually calculate correct payments for the items dispensed. A pharmacist must complete all required columns for each instalment, so the form must be endorsed with the date of supply, the item supplied, quantity, and initialed by the pharmacist for every dispensing instalment in order to receive the correct payments. If a patient fails to pick up an instalment, the right hand side of the form should be clearly marked as not dispensed or not collected written in full in the item column, or the whole line should be crossed out. Abbreviations to indicate not dispensed such as ND, DNA for did not attend or NC for not collected should not be included in the, dis in the pharmacist's initials, as these can easily be mistaken for a person's initials. In the box in the bottom left hand of the prescription form, the dispenser should endorse the total number of patient interactions, that is the number of times the patient has collected their medicine or treatment, as specified by the prescriber. Any missed instalment should not be included here. Information in this box is not used for reimbursement purposes by the BSA. It is used for pharmacy audit purposes only and it is best practice to complete this part of the prescription. It can also help to calculate the number of package dose fees for methadone prescriptions, but also serve as a useful check for pricing stuff at the BSA. I will talk through the package dose PD endorsement in the next slide. Pharmacists are reminded that when endorsing an NDA form, they should try and fit all the relevant information in the correct endorsing line. However, we often do get asked how MDA instalment prescriptions form should be, should be endorsed if there is insufficient room on the right hand side of the forms. Unfortunately, there is nothing currently in place that allows for extra space to aid a pharmacist in these circumstances. For example, additional piece of paper cannot be attached to the prescription. Any endorsement attached to the prescription on a separate piece of paper will not be processed, by the B, processed for payment by the BSA. Any paper stuck or clipped or pinned to a prescription will be removed without being read. So if two or more different drugs are ordered on the same FP10 MDA form with instructions for daily dispensing, there's two possible options for the pharmacist to consider on how to endorse. Firstly, the pharmacy should try and utilize a space in each installment box to the maximum. So where the two drugs are prescribed, they should be endorsed clearly one above the other in the box. We would advise that the pharmacist should attempt to avoid unnecessary dispensing endorsements and be clear. However, the pharmacist should be made aware that if this endorsement is not clear, there is delay in possible inaccurate payments on the prescription. 
And the second option is the pharmacist can request a prescriber to issue two separate prescriptions at the time of prescribing, which may reduce the need for lengthy endorsements. The PD or package dose endorsement. A package dose or PD fee of 55 pence can be claimed for methadone or a liquid where the individual doses have been packaged in separate daily dose containers. The PD fee can be claimed on both FP10 and FP10 MDA prescriptions for oral liquid methadone only. Prescriptions must be endorsed as PD followed by the number N. N is calculated as the number of separately packaged doses supplied minus the number of patient interactions. Any other variation to the endorsement will not be accepted for payment by the PSA. The number of separately packaged doses claimed must be clearly endorsed on the prescription, as fee will be based on the correct endorsements specified. Most EPS systems now allow the PD endorsement to electronic prescriptions for methadone or solution 2. This slide shows how to correctly endorse and claim for PD fees on both green paper FP10 prescription forms and blue FP10 MDA forms ordering methadone oral solution. On the green FP10 form on the left hand side, the pharmacist has supplied seven daily dose containers of 40 mils each. On FP10, as there is only one patient interaction or dispensing episode, the PD value is calculated as 6. This is seven daily dose containers of 40 mils minus one patient interaction which equals to six so the pharmacist would endorse pd6 and this works out to 55 pence times six which is three pound thirty in addition to the other usual payments for this prescription on the right hand side you've got the blue fp10 mda prescription form where the patient is given 14 daily dose containers of 40 mils each over six dispensing episodes. The value of PD here is calculated as 14 package doses or daily dose containers minus six patient interactions, which equals to eight. So the pharmacist would endorse PD8 and receive £4.40 in addition to the other usual payments for this prescription. Thanks, Suresh. We'll now look at completing the reverse of CD prescriptions. When a Schedule 2 CD is collected from a pharmacy, legislation states that the pharmacist must ascertain whether the person collecting is the patient, patient's representative or healthcare professional. In the case of Schedule 2 CD prescriptions, for example methadone, the person may, if not already known to the pharmacist, be asked to present some form of identification. If the person collecting the Schedule 2 CD is a healthcare professional acting in their professional capacity on behalf of the patient, the pharmacist must ask for identification and obtain evidence of name, address and professional registration number of the healthcare professional. Note that the requirements for signing the prescription and identification of collection apply to instalment prescriptions only on the first occasion that the person presents. Where the person is collecting the CDs refuses to provide their details, e.g. name to record in the PMR or does not sign the reverse of the form or token, a pharmacist using the professional discretion may still supply the CDs. As with any other NHS prescription, the reverse should be completed in full with, a, with the patient's declaration of payment or exemption status and their signature. A representative, including delivery driver, can sign on behalf of the patient. However, a robust audit trial should be available to confirm successful delivery of the medicine to the patient. Instalment prescriptions only need to be signed once. Alternatively, some pharmacists may wish to record the details of the CD collector electronically, e.g. within their patient record. Retaining electronic records within the pharmacy, reducing the use of paper tokens to capture signatures of CD collectors helps align with the NHS's paperless objectives. If a patient pays for their prescriptions, they would only need to pay one prescription charge for each item. On an FP10 MDA form, patients do not need to pay a charge for each instalment collected. However, if two different items, for example, buprenorphine and diazepam, or an item with two different formulations of the same drugs, for, exa for example, uh, capsules or tablets, are ordered on the same FP10 MDA form, two prescription charges would apply.
The images on this slide show how FP10 MDA forms should be submitted. Before submission, pharmacy staff involved in the end of month submission process should check that the reverse of the MDA forms are correctly signed before sorting into the relevant exempt or paid groups. The blue form should be unfolded and banded together, separating them from the rest of the prescription bundle. Submitting the MDA forms folded may slow down NHSBSA's prescription scanning processes. If a FP10 MDA form is torn, i.e. the perforated section is broken, the form should be taped back together and placed with the other FP10 MDA forms. The illustration on this slide shows how FP10 MDA forms should be submitted to NHSBSA. Firstly, please ensure that the reverse of the MDA forms are signed with correct paid or exempt declarations and sorted into the relevant exempt or paid groups as illustrated previously. All blue instalment prescription forms should be separated from the rest of the prescription bundle as these forms are passed to a separate stream of handlers or operators at NHSBSA so they can be manually checked and processed for payment. Any green FP10 forms with CDs on should be placed in the main prescription bundle unless they meet the criteria for inclusion in red separators. This slide shows all the different payments for CD prescriptions. As with NHS prescriptions for other drugs, all CD prescriptions attract a single activity fee, which is currently £1.27. For instalment dispensing prescriptions, a single activity fee is paid per interaction or pickup. All Schedule 2 CDs receive a fee of £1.28 per item, and all Schedule 3 CDs are paid a fee of 43 pence per item. No endorsement is necessary to claim this fee. And on an MDA form for Schedule 2 or 3 CDs, a CD fee is paid per interaction or per pickup. A consumable allowance is paid at 1.24 pence per item. A consumable fee is paid per interaction or pickup on an instalment dispensing form. If the total quantity of a CD does not correspond to the available pack size, Contractors will also receive a 10p container allowance. Additional fees are payable for prescriptions requesting methadone or oral liquid. An item level fee of £2.50 is paid for all methadone or oral liquid preparations, which are issued on a green FP10 or a blue FP10 MDA form. This is only paid once per prescription and is paid automatically. Therefore, no endorsement is required to claim for it. And finally, for methadone, there is also a package dose fee of 55 pence for daily dose containers, which we have covered in previous slides. As a reminder, pharmacists can claim this by endorsing PD followed by the number of fees to claim. So now we'll look at types of CD prescription endorsing errors. Uh, using some mocked up and actual anonymized um, FP10 MDA forms provided by NHSBSA, we will go through some examples of incorrect or poor endorsements. The most common types of CD prescription errors NHSBSA encounter are incorrect claiming of PD fees, whether it be incorrect number of PD fees claimed or wrong, in, uh, wrong initials endorsed, e.g. DD or PP rather than PD, uh, missed potential PD fees by not endorsing anything, trying to claim PD fees on products not allowed, such as buprenorphine, incomplete instalment lines or missing information, e.g. some initials are omitted, uh, miscalculated quantities, unclear not dispensed or MD items, endorsed information not matching the original order written by the prescriber, pharmacy or prescriber stamps covering vital information. So in this example, the PD endorsement for package dose claims looks like PP instead of PD. The correct endorsement is PD followed by the number which is calculated as the number of package doses minus the number of patient interactions or dispensing episodes. In this case, the PD fee would not be paid or referred back to the pharmacy. Any other variations to this endorsement, for example, the use of PP, DD, PDS, the number before PD, or if it is written in words as package dose will not be accepted by NHSBSA. It must be endorsed as PD followed by a number as previously stated. Remember that the PD endorsement can only be applied to prescriptions for oral liquid methadone. It cannot be claimed for any other drugs. 
On most systems, the PD endorsement can now be claimed on electronic prescriptions for oral methadone solution. In this example, it may be unclear to the operators at NHSBSA whether the abbreviations N slash D endorsed in the pharmacist initial column refers to the actual pharmacist initials or whether it refers to not dispensed. The NHSBSA find it very difficult to confirm the quantity dispensed if the pharmacist initial box includes N slash D or N slash C, as these can also be interpreted as not dispensed or not collected respectively. An HSBSA would refer these prescriptions back to the pharmacy if they were unclear on what was intended. If an instalment has been missed by the patient, instead of marking ND or NC in the pharmacist initials box, the NHSBSA recommends pharmacists to write out in full words, not dispensed or not collected in the item section. You will, auto, you will also notice that the pharmacist has endorsed CD and DND for discount not deducted on the left hand side of the form. The DND endorsement is not required since methadone being a Schedule 2 CD is automatically granted DND status. Additionally, all prescribed Schedule 2 and 3 CDs automatically receive a CD fee and a CD endorsement is not required. This example shows incomplete or missing entries on the right hand side of the form. The pharmacist has endorsed the first two dispense dates but has not included any additional information on the item or quantity dispensed. Some of the entries have also not been initialed by the pharmacist. It will be unclear to the NHSBSA if instalments due on these dates have been dispensed. If an instalment was not dispensed, the words not dispensed or not collected should be written in for in the dispensed item column. Pharmacists should also avoid using ditto marks in the endorsement line to indicate a repeat of previous entry. For each dispensing episode, the date, item name, quantity supplied and the pharmacist initials should be clearly endorsed. So in this example, the pharmacist is required to supply the complete quantity of 42 Subutex tabs on the 18th of March. However, the pharmacist has endorsed four by four times OP on the 18th and two times OP on the 22nd, which technically does not align with the prescriber's directions, which state that installment prescriptions covering more than one day should be collected on the specified day. For endorsement of quantity, use of OP for original packs is not recommended as the pack size may not always be obvious to processing staff at NHSBSA, particularly if multiple pack sizes exist. Therefore, when endorsing the quantity supplied, the endorsement should be either the total number of unit doses supplied, that is in the number of tablets or number of packs given against pack size for e.g. 4x7 tabs. It is also not clear what was dispensed in the second line of the dispense column as it looks like ditto marks. As per the previous slide for each dispensing episode, the date, item, name, quantity supplied and pharmacist initials should be clearly endorsed. In this example, the quantity endorsed does not match the quantity ordered. This prescription requires the pharmacist to supply two tablets of buprenorphine on the 17th and the same number of tablets on the 18th. But the pharmacist has instead endorsed as four tablets dispensed on the 17th and none on the 18th. There is no Home Office approved wording on this prescription authorising supply in advance of pharmacy closure days. So the dose due on the 18th cannot be supplied in advance on the 17th. If no tablets are supplied on the 18th, it is preferable for the pharmacist to endorse the dispense line as not collected or not dispensed as previously indicated. In this example, the quantities endorsed on the right hand side of the form do not match the total quantity endorsed on the left hand side. The total of all dispensing episodes endorsed on the right hand side add up to 25 tablets, but the pharmacist has endorsed 26. Either quantity endorsed is incorrect or total quantity has been miscalculated. To avoid confusion or risk of incorrect payments, the pharmacist should check that 
the quantity endorsements on the left hand side of the form tally up with what has been endorsed on the right hand side of the form. So we're on the last example here. Uh, in this example, a prescriber has stamped the right hand side of the MDA form obscuring the pharmacist endorsement. Prescribers or pharmacy stamps in the endorsement area may impact NHS BSA's ability to read what has been endorsed on the prescription. If the NHS BSA cannot clearly read what has been endorsed on the lines in the right hand side, this can affect payments. If you receive such a prescription, it would be advisable to return it to the prescriber and ask them to rewrite it without any markings or stamps in the endorsement area. Pharmacy staff should also avoid marking this area of the prescription with pharmacy stamps. I will now hand you over back to Leila, who will talk through private CDs and CD requisitions. Thanks, Mitesh. Standardised private prescription forms are required for private prescribing of all Schedule 2 and 3 CDs dispensed in community pharmacies. In England, Schedules 2 and 3 CDs must be written on specially designated forms FP10 PCD, which are provided by NHS England local area teams. The FP10 PCD must include the prescriber's six-figure identification number unique for private prescribing. Private prescriptions for Schedule 2 and 3 CDs should not be dispensed in community pharmacies if they do not contain this unique identifier which is different to the prescriber's NHS number. Private prescribers should be referred to their primary care organisation, for example their local NHS England team, if they require a private prescriber identification number. FP10 PCDs must be submitted to NHS BSA for analysis and monitoring purpose no later than the fifth day of the month following which they were dispensed. The private CD forms must be submitted using the appropriate FP34 PCD submission document available to download from the NHS BSA website. The private FP10 PCD forms must not be included with other NHS prescription forms submitted to the NHS BSA each month. Following recommendations from the shipment inquiry from November 2015, it became mandatory for healthcare professionals to use an approved form for the requisitioning of Schedule 2 and 3 CDs in the community. The approved form, FP10 CDF form for requisitioning Schedule 2 and 3 CDs can be accessed and downloaded from the NHS BSA's website. This standardised written requisition form must be obtained by the pharmacy before delivery of any Schedule 2 or 3 CDs to healthcare professionals requesting Schedule 2 and 3 CDs for use in their practice. The Home Office advises that supplies from one registered pharmacy to another registered pharmacy should only be made after receiving a written requisition on an approved requisition form. Regulations require the supplier of the CDs to mark on the requisition their name and address at the time the supply is made. A pharmacy stamp containing the name and address of the pharmacy could meet this requirement. Once completed, the original FP10 CDF form must be submitted by the pharmacy to the NHS BSA using the FP34 PCD submission document available to download from the NHS BSA, the same form used for submission of FP10 PCD private CD prescriptions. The FP10 PCD and FP10 CDF forms are required to be submitted to the NHS BSA so that prescribing and purchases of Schedule 2 and 3 CDs by individual healthcare professionals in the community can be monitored. Community pharmacies require a private CD account number which should be used when submitting FP10 CDF mandatory requisition forms. Pharmacies who need to submit private prescription forms and requisitions but who do not already have a private CD prescription S code must contact their local NHS England team for this. Welcome back. I hope you found the information covered today useful. I, I am conscious of time and that we are nearing the end of the hour that was planned in. We will try and get to some of your questions today and for those that we're not able to get to, don't worry, the PSNC team will prepare answers and we will either post them on our website today once ready or come back to you directly with responses. 
Uh, please note some of the questions may fall outside of PSNC's remit and we may need to refer you to alternative sources for further advice. So on to the first question, um, it's fairly straightforward. Will the slides be available to view again later? Um, I can confirm that yes, in a few days time, the slides deck, the slide deck and the webinar recording will be available to view on PSNC's website should you or a member of your team need to refer to it again in the future. Um, the next question I have is, is the requirement for Schedule 2 and 3 CDs to be signed for? Um, still not required and until when? So I think this relates to the suspension period for capturing patient signatures. Um, I'll pass you over to Mitish who will be able to answer that for you. Thanks, Suraj. Um, so the temporary uh, suspension of requirement for patients or their representatives to sign the back of NHS prescription form or EPS tokens um, came into effect on the 1st of November 2020, so last year. Um, the suspension was um, initially expected to last until the 31st of March, but as many of you are aware, we did manage to get it extended until the 31st of August uh, 2021, and we are still um, awaiting a decision um, and pressing DHSC the Department of Health for a further, ext uh, for a further extension. Thanks, Mitesh. Um, the next question I have is um, one for Leila. Do, do healthcare professionals need a mandatory requisition form to order stock of Schedule 2 and 3 CDs? Let me check if Leila is on the line. Uh, if not, we can come back to that. Um, let me let me ask the next question then. Um, Mitesh, perhaps one for you. If the PD fee is not endorsed correctly, do you get paid anything by the BSA? Um, so if the PD fee is not endorsed correctly, as um, we, we stated in the, in the slides, so if it's not um, endorsed as PD followed by the number of package doses, um, uh, sorry, by the uh, number of package doses minus the number of patient interactions or dispensing episodes, um, it would not be paid. So even if you did, um, I think someone's also asked another question of if I put PD, um, X8. Um, if you did that as well, that would not be paid. Um, so you need to make sure it's if it's PD8. You need if it's eight um, PDs that you're claiming for, it needs to be PD8. Thank you. Um, there's one that I've got here. Do the dispense and claim notification messages for Schedule Two or Three CDs prescribed using EPS need to be submitted within 28 days of the date on the script? Um, I'll take that. So, so legally, all Schedule 2 and 3 CDs must be dispensed within 28 days off the appropriate date. However, for the purposes of claiming reimbursement, pharmacy systems should allow you to send these claim notification messages or the dispense note messages after the validity period of 28 days, as it, is rec as it is recognized that scenarios may exist, such as technical or internet outages, where it may not be possible to submit a claim before the 28 days, even though the drugs were supplied within the period of validity. So your system supplier may alert you to any CD scripts yet to be dispensed and approaching their 28-day expiry, but we do recommend checking with your system supplier uh, as um, there may be sort of unique uh, processes in place for each. Um, I'll see if Leila's back and just to go back on the question that we had, do, do healthcare professionals need a mandatory requisition form to order stock of Schedule 2 and 3 CDs? Hi, yes, I'm back. Apologies. Um, yes, in um, in England, the standardised FP10 CDF form must be used. Uh, supplies made against a faxed or, say, photocopied requisition are not acceptable. Thanks, Leila. And, and another, another one, what is the limit to the quantity on an FP10 MDA form? Yes, um, there's... Uh, Sorry, bear with me a moment. I'm just trying to get my head. Yes, when using an um, uh, FP10 MDA form, a prescriber must only order a quantity of a CD that provides treatment for a period not ex exceeding uh, 14 days. Thank you, Leila. Um, I've got a couple more. So, can I claim PD fees on a green FP10 form? Uh, Mitesh, are you able to cover this one? 
Yeah, um, so yes, you can claim PD um, fees on the green FP10 form as well as, well as the blue um, FP10 MDA form. Um, you need to make yeah. sure, as as we discussed before, that it's written as PD um, followed by the number of package doses minus the number of interactions. Okay, and I think there's a follow-up question. If the PD fee is not calculated correctly, do you get anything? Um, that is a good question. We we might have to come back to you on that just to confirm with the BSA if they would treat it by working out how many PD fees they ought to have paid or will they invalidate the claim completely. So um can leave that with us and, and we will get back to you on that. The um, next one I've got is can suboxone, which is the buprenorphine naloxone combination ordered on a FP10 MDA blue prescription form? Um, I can answer that. That that is correct. Yes, suboxone being a shed well, suboxone being a schedule three which contains buprenorphine can be ordered on an FP10 MDA form. I believe it is only drugs that contain buprenorphine for the treatment of addiction um, as as a schedule three that can be ordered on such a form. Um, let's have a look. See what else we've got coming in. Right, there's one here. On an EPS prescription, can I claim the package dose fees, that's the PD fees for supplying methadone oral liquid in daily dose containers? Um, I'll return back to the expert on PD fees, Mitesh, for an answer on this. Okay, so yeah, as far as we're aware, contractors can claim um, PD fees on um, EP on EPS prescriptions. Um, obviously, we've been through how the, the PD fees should be calculated. Um, I must add, though, there is no uh, provision uh, to dispense methadone um, oral liquid in instalments using um, electronic prescriptions. So um, you, the the equivalent of the blue FP10 MDA is not available on EPS um, currently, um, but PD can be uh, claimed. Brilliant. Um, another one's just popped in. Do we need to use a private PCD form to prescribe Schedule 4 and 5 CDs. Um, my understanding is I believe that that form is intended for Schedule 2 and 3 CDs. It's not to say that a Schedule 4 or 5 or a POM may not be prescribed on it, but it, it may be counterproductive to use such stationery for that purpose, in which case you, the prescriber should really be using ordinary stationery to prescribe non-Schedule 2 and 3 CDs. Um, I think the intended purpose of the FP10 PCD form is for Schedule 2 and 3 CDs only. Um, let's see if there's anything else that we've got. Uh, where do you get your private CD account number from? Um, Leila, is this something you can help with? Yes, um, you get that from your uh, NHS um, local England so area team. It can be said as area team as well. You need to contact them to get the account number for your um, pharmacy. Great. Um, I believe let's have a look. One more that we can do. Um, in the bottom left hand side of the FP10 MDA form, there is a box to allow pharmacists to record the total number of items on the script. Is it mandatory to complete this box? Um, Mitesh, is that something you can help with? Yeah, sure. So um, it's not actually mandatory to complete the box um, with the total dis um, items that have been dispensed, but uh, we do recommend it as it does serve as a useful check for prescription pricing stuff. So it's helpful if that box can be completed. Um, and it, it, it's also well, it, it's also good to note that not, that the number entered in this box should reflect the number of patient interactions or pickups, as they're called, um, from the pharmacy only. Great. Um, so it looks like I think we've run the course of our presentation. I know we've gone over time today, um, and I'm afraid we haven't been able to get to every question. But like I said earlier, what we'll do is either post the answers to the questions on our website or come back to you directly. Um, so, so can I just wrap up by saying thank you all for dedicating your time this evening to listen into the webinar and uh, we do value your feedback, including suggestions for future webinar topics. Um, and if you can, please do take a moment to complete the short survey that will appear on your screen shortly. 
um, just promise all uh, have a good night.